Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Atheist Alliance International Podcast. I'm Jason Sylvester, a.k.a. Diogenes of Mayberry, your host. And I'd like to remind everyone to please like and subscribe as we get going. And today we have a special guest, uh, Arena, who is a nuclear particle physicist. I'm probably saying that wrong, but uh, she's one of our volunteers with the Atheist Support Network, and she's here to talk about her journey and her work with ASN and her work in science. So welcome, Marina, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. It was very nice yeah. to meet you. So did I, did I get that wrong, saying you're a nuclear particle physicist? Or maybe you, you can you could probably explain it better than I can. So floor is yours. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think like the best way to explain what I do is experimental particle physicist. So um, particle physics is basically a more, much more wider, wider field compared to the nuclear physics. It's just basically uh, particle physics deals with high energy events while the nuclear physics deals with low energy events. So there are things that they overlap. There are studies where they overlap these two fields. And okay. yes. Okay. So are, are you are you going to be like our next Einstein and you're going to unravel the mysteries of the universe? <laughs> well, Einstein was a theor theoretical physicist, well, so true, I don't yeah. think I will be working exactly the way he did. But there are, of course, many, many things to achieve in experimental physics, like different kinds of um, there are, I think, more Nobel laureates from experimental physics <laughs> than theoretical. Okay. So but, you're, you're uh, kind of like uh, Leonard on, on Big Bang Theory. You're the experimental guy, not the theoretical guy like yes. Shelby. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> cool. So it's, it's a, as we were chatting just before we got started, I've, I've never met anybody who does what you do. So I, I look forward to future discussions with you and, and the, the breakthroughs you're making because I think it'd be, it'd be fascinating to keep up with your career. So, um, yeah. So, so you're originally from Bangladesh, uh, from a, a strict family. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about uh, for, you know, about your, your upbringing and then what brought you uh, to become an atheist and working in, in the scientific field? Yeah, well, I was born in a rather, rather strict family. I would say so, because uh, um, in our family, there was, there was not much uh, this idea of freedom. Freedom, freedom wasn't very much of a cup of tea for everybody. So I think the first person who kind of challenged that structure was my mother. <laughs> and uh, I don't know of anybody else before her who did that. So she basically challenged the, the basic notion what a woman can do. She went ahead and uh, worked as a single mother raised me. And uh, I think that is where the first first definition of freedom, what a woman can do, was defined through my mother. Uh, but still, there were many, many components of religion and culture that were deeply ingrained into the family traditions. So uh, we did not have much discussion uh, at all about, let's say, science or rationalism at all. Rather, our family members mostly talked about religion, afterlife, and so forth hell and heaven, those were like some of the things I grew up with. So I I was given like a science book by a distant relative when I was six years old. And that was the first science book I opened and I saw like the, the round planet, you know, that the earth is round. And the first question I had is that, why, why is it round? <laughs> and if it is round, if it is spinning around, then how come we are not falling down? Like we are all just sitting on the surface. and. Uh, there were absolutely nobody around me who could answer. So I clearly remember that I was desperate to know and I used to ask more and more. And the only answer I ever got is because Allah made it. Allah made all of this. And Allah is the reason why we are here. And eventually, of course, I started uh, getting more curious about the nature around me, for example. Uh, what about these thunderstorms? How are these thunders being produced? I mean, they look really scary to a child, right? <laughs> uh, but then uh, the same same answers, like it, it's Allah who is making it. So uh, I, I don't remember a single time that anybody gave me a rational answer of anything. It was always Allah and it was always because that is how it is. 
sometimes uh, when I started growing up, I started uh, feeling the heat of religion when I reached my puberty. <laughs> that is when I first felt uh, the first heat of religion because uh, then there were people in the family uh, talking about uh, if, if, if I should be allowed to wear whatever I wanted. You know, now I'm a grown woman, so like the dress was a big big issue i think my mom kind of handled it pretty well she she didn't let anybody to make a decision on my clothing but uh, i started getting influenced by my surrounding and started wearing hijab at the age of 11 approximately and i but wore hijab your mother, about, your mother didn't force you to wear it though not at all she she was the only person basically supporting me to choose whatever I wanted to wear or not. So she, she never ever influenced, uh, like she never really imposed any religious duties or anything. It was always like cousins, aunts, and other people like, you know, the distant relatives, those were the people constantly pushing. And I, I, I grew up without a father. It means like uh, my mom divorced him when, when I was very, very little. So I don't have any memory of him. Uh, so the first 10, 11 years, uh, there was no father figure at home. But we had uh, my uncle living with us because in Bangladesh, you know, a single mother raising a daughter is not easy. She needs some kind of male figure around at the house. So we, ha we had uh, my maternal uncle staying with us most of the time. And then my mother uh, got married again and I had my stepfather at the age of approximately 11 uh, and yeah then we moved to Dhaka before that uh, we were we were living elsewhere within Bangladesh so and so when there was no father figure I think I had more freedom because there was only my mother to take care of everything but my puberty hit and at the same time my stepdad comes to our life and things start changing um, there were lots of criticisms pressures not directly because there was always this mother to protect me, but there were always pressures uh, to kind of dress in a certain way who we I can't talk with. For example, I wasn't allowed to talk with boys in our class. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't allowed to go out with my friends. And uh, most of the time that I managed to go out is because my mother uh, just kind of excused or managed it, but it wasn't always possible. I started wearing hijab not because uh, anybody forced me, but because I was very badly brainwashed. So there were there there are family members I have who are extremely religious, and some of them are also uh, engaged in religious politics. If you know about Shibir and Jamaat, and yeah, so they are they are extremely religious, extremely religious. And then there there is this. Uh, more or less moderate part of my family where I was born. My mom was always moderate. She never really forced. But then the extreme part, like the religious extreme um, part always had this pressure on us. Like if they came to visit our home, there were always discussions about uh, how much my mom is spoiling me and so forth. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I started wearing hijab because I was brainwashed by some uh, distant relatives and they, they instilled this fear of hell in my mind. And I was introduced with the idea that if you upset the creator, there are punishments waiting for you. And the punishments of the description of punishments were so horrible, so, so cruel. As a child, I felt helpless. I felt like if if that's how I will be treated for not covering myself, then I'd rather cover myself, you know. So I wore hijab for about two, three years. And uh, after that, I think uh, a very interesting event happened in my life. And then I left hijab completely. And I started questioning religion from that point on. Okay. And so do you, the, one of the issues I've had with hijab is it's basically to to cover the hair to, for a woman to be modest. Yet the same God who created everything according to the, the theists gave you this hair in the first place. So it seems rather counterintuitive that God would give us these, you know, hair and a sex drive to cover the hair and repress her. It just, the whole thing is is really bizarre. So 
Okay, so you mentioned like uh, like why is the Earth round and these other scientifically inquisitive questions you had, and you kept getting the answer that it's just Allah. So even even in your science classes in school, you were getting these kind of answers as well, or were you getting a, a proper science education uh, in your high school years? Um, if I have to summarize the kind of science education I received in Bangladesh, I would say that it didn't really give me any basics in anything. Uh, uh, it was it was very superficial, I would say, the superficial teaching. So the teachers enter classes and they they just talk about certain topics. They don't go deeply anywhere, and there you know I used to ask a lot of questions in the class, and oftentimes the teachers will just not know how to handle them or answer them, and they would just avoid it. And sometimes they will get very very uncomfortable because of my questions, and they would shut me down, saying that hey, it's not from syllabus. Nobody's going to ask you questions on this. You just, uh, like there were certain kinds of questions uh, more likely to come to the exams and they then urged that, why do you just read these ones only and why you keep asking this? So there were all kinds of teachers that I met. Some teachers, they just downright shoved me away saying that I'm thinking way too much outside the syllabus. And then there were teachers who were very uncomfortable with the kind of questions I threw at them. And then there were teachers who were like uh, very, very, I would say strict. So I didn't really feel that much comfortable to ask them those questions. They were like uh, punishing students if, if the students didn't behave according to their wishes. So uh, then I didn't feel comfortable to ask them much questions. <laughs> and you didn't have even a single teacher that nurtured your, your inquisitive side and, and gave you books to read or Pointed not you in much, no. Wow, that's not at all. Uh, that's rather sad. Okay. So, so uh, curiosity on science is something that I actually uh, uh, started started feeling when I read a lot of books. So it's it's after I hit my puberty, my world became really narrow. You know, I wasn't allowed to go play outside. I wasn't allowed to. Uh, go out with friends. So after school, I had so much of time and I had to some, somehow stay sane. My, my, my male cousins were having life outside. They could go out, play. They could have friends to hang around with. I didn't. If I had to go out, I had to have either like somebody older than me to take me out. And most of the time there were nobody around who could take me out. So I, so I was. Your mother was more moderate. She she wouldn't let you go play after you hit puberty. Well, she would, would. She wished I could, but the but the environment, the society, is not really safe for women. You know, for young girls, <laughs> she she like oftentimes regretted the fact that we didn't have a nice play field next to our house. And even if there was a play, play field next to our house, it was always occupied by men. So so. I did not feel comfortable to go play there. Okay. And also there were these uh, these uh, statements uh, coming from different directions towards my mother that in sports club, you know what I mean? So I wanted to go, for example, join female sports club. But there there were these statements thrown at, at our girls, don't, don't go. As if like that is something only low class girls are supposed to do, if that makes sense. So our okay. girls stay at home come back from school and like a good girl, they stay at home. They don't they don't make many friends outside and they don't go to the sports club, uh, even if it is 100% female. So the kind of loneliness I faced because my mom had to work all day, you know, to put bread on bread and butter on the table. So I, I, I suffered very much loneliness as a, as a growing teenager and I needed some kind of <laughs> way out from that sad reality. And I took refuge to books. I used to read a lot of books, a lot. And that is when I got, uh, got first introduced with Hypatia and I fell in love with the character. I, I fell in love with Lisa Meitner, I fell in love with Madame Kuhi and all these people, I got to know about this this woman. You know, they they they, they started uh, those stories started the spark of curiosity. That if they could do it, why can't I? So. Okay, 
So in, was these books that you were reading on your own sort of sparked your your curiosity for science and that led you in this this direction for your education? Because you, you obviously weren't getting it in school. So it was the yeah. books you were reading that were there. Okay, so were, were you surprised by anything? Like you, did you read something that really shook your worldview? You know, you've been, you've been raised sort of in this strict, oh, all of this and God made it this way. And then, did you read ever read anything that just, just completely shook your worldview in a science textbook that, wow, this, this, is, this is the answer I've been looking for? Uh, I can't really pinpoint that one book because there are so many good ones, you know. Uh, but I remember I really did not like reading religious books at all because they were so boring. They were full of threats. Even as a small child, I could feel it. You know, in one hand, I was very scared of Allah. On the other hand, I did not like the fact no matter which religious book you pick up, it doesn't really answer anything. It just tries to remind you what would happen to you if you don't believe to it, believe it. But on the other hand, when I read the science books, there, there, there is no intimidation. There is no threat going on there. It's, it's just like a child looking at the universe and asking questions, trying to learn more. And that innocence of a child's mind is what uh, science pushes science forward. And I love, I fell in love with that. I fell in love with the fact that no matter what the question is, there are minds around the world coming from different backgrounds. There are different genders. There are different um, ethnicities. They're coming together to figure out how this universe works instead of just saying that, hey, you have to believe this or you are doomed. So in my, un in my unconscious mind, I fell in love with the idea of freedom of thought, the idea that I can think anything without feeling guilty or fear. I think that is the profound idea that really shook me. I fell in love with science because of that. There is no question you can't ask. <laughs> okay. So when, when did you start questioning your faith? Before you left for university or by the time you'd been in university and was, were studying this? So where did, where did your sort of uh, atheistic awakening, if we can turn it, term it that, where, where did that come or when did that come? Yeah, I, I guess like 9-11 um, happened, you know, and yeah, I remember some people in my family were very happy it happened. They were actually supporting 9-11. And uh, I was way too young. I didn't, didn't, I, could, I didn't have that much of knowledge or understanding of the surrounding to make a theory. Why? Why are certain people supporting this? Why are certain people opposing this? All I knew that uh, some people claimed that if you were a Muslim, you're supposed to support it. You know, it's, but what I started growing uh, curious because I was given certain ideas. For example, science comes from the Quran, first of all, and then I was told that Muslims are always oppressed and yeah, we have enemies we need to fight with. This kind of very extremist ideas, they were not coming from necessarily the moderate side of the family, but since we have some family members who are more extreme, those ideas were constantly be being flooded towards us like, and I got exposed to some of them. And I started asking these questions that so why does it happen? Uh, like, why are, are, are we having these enemies? Why are they our enemies? <laughs> so why don't they like us, you know? And, and what does it mean, uh, uh, these, these, these bombings? What does it mean? Is it something that uh, we are supposed to do and we are supposed to feel good about? Because I, I, I clearly remember that I didn't feel good about it. I was thinking continuously that thousands of people uh, dying or dead and their tears. And I remember my mom was also crying. She was clearly not at all happy with what happened. So were you, were you a teenager when 9-11 happened just for the context? Exactly. Of, okay. Yeah. And I so, was that, a teenager. That sort of, and so that sort of started you down the, the road of, of yes. questioning. Okay. Yes. And at the same time, around that same time, I think one of my mom's colleague criticized my hijab. <laughs> So when he met me, he said, what is this on your head? <laughs> Why are you wearing this? And I was like, I was a bit shocked. I was like, because I was getting a lot of bravado from everywhere else. Oh, I'm now a hijabi girl. I'm a Muslim, you know. 
So I, I like that attention. I like the fact that all other uh, religious girls were being my friends and I had more positive vibe from extended family. People were sending me different color hijabs. I, I felt accepted to the crowd. So I was enjoying it uh, because I was trying to get rid of this loneliness that otherwise was there. And But his question kind of threw me off because I knew that among my mom's... Uh, colleagues, he is one of the most learned ones. <laughs> he was also a freedom fighter. So I, I was like, but he's a Muslim, right? That's what I thought. Like, he's a Muslim. How come he doesn't support hijab? And then he asked me, do you know why you are wearing it? I said, no. And then he, he, he made like a comments at me, like devil under the scarf. Do you know what it means? I was like, yeah. no. <laughs> He's like, okay, you, you need to figure out, you need to learn more. Why are you wearing this? Because I heard from your mother that you are very curious. Uh, I did not expect this from you, that you will just blindly wear something. You need to first know why you are wearing it. So I went home. I took off my hijab. I told everybody I'm not wearing it anymore because I don't know what this represents. And just why a, am I... One question and just instantly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, instantly, because I did, I don't know, right? That's that's the fact. I don't know why did Allah uh, give this order. So then yeah. I started reading hadiths and Quran. That is the point. I actually genuinely sparked this. Nine eleven is one reason. Then this this uncle of mine questioning my hijab was another reason. So these these events basically sparked that that kind of uh, question in my mind. What is this religion really trying to do? You know, because in one hand, I'm told that so and so are our enemies, you know, then I'm the victim. But at the same time, I see my people going and blowing a building. In that case, I don't think we are the victim. So these kind of contradictions were all the time around. Then I also came across a person whose name sounds Muslim, uh, Muslim name, and who, who is supposed to be a Muslim, as far I knew back then. But he is not liking my hijab. He, he just questioned me. Why are you wearing this? Do you know anything? Why are you wearing this? Then I started realizing that, yeah, that's true. I don't really know enough about my own religion. So I need to know. And that is the point I, I started digging. Okay. And then you went off to university and you studied science. So is that the point then where you, you became an atheist? Or was it after you graduated, you realized you didn't believe anymore? Or where, where did your... your your coming out happened. <laughs> the the strongest coming out happened when I came to Finland. Before that, I was more of a. I did not really call myself an atheist or Muslim or anything. I just called myself a student of theology. I remember I called that to myself before, and I told everybody that I don't know enough to call myself anything. And it's only after I think I started my master's that my understanding of my own religion or forefathers' religion, world politics, science started taking like a strong enough shape that I could actually see how the structure works. Uh, because I don't really think it's that easy to, to give up one's religion because you see, as, as a young child, I used to think that if, if my religion is wrong, how come everything is built on it? There are thousands of mosques around. Nobody's stopping it if it is a lie. They're teaching it in the university, in the school. If it was a lie, why are they teaching this? It's a valid question. You wouldn't go around teaching a lie, right? And you have an entire government which cracks down on, for example, if you're trying to sell like a fake medicine, even in the, in the, in the village areas, you, you, you're medical license may get cancelled if you are not selling right medicines, right? Uh, but then how come you are like preaching something that is not true, but you are getting away with it? It means it, it should have some truth in it, isn't it? Like that's what my mind in the beginning got into the state of questions. Like, so if religion is completely fake or Islam is completely fake, why is it still there? Why is it still there in not only my country, it is so much there that nobody questions it. 
because um, the majority of people aren't like you and me that, that do question and are inquisitive and, and look into it. They just accept it. That's what's kept religion yeah. going for thousands and thousands of years. So. I didn't know politics back then. <laughs> Later oh, on, who I know that how politicians use it and how, how the power power dynamics work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so then with with your mom, who is a is a more moderate, uh, I presume she knows you are an atheist now? Yes, she does. And she, she, she's she, very respectful. She she accepts me the way I am. And she okay. she instilled this value in me as a young child that the only thing she cares if I'm a good human being. In her definition, good means that I bring something positive to the society and people around me. She doesn't care uh, who I marry or uh, what age I get married or which religion I'm from or if I believe in God or not. She's 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 very, very sweet when it comes to this. And I'm very lucky to have her. You have that support network because a lot a lot of atheists don't. Their their families will turn their back, especially if they're from from uh, strict Muslim families. So so the rest of your strict family, do they know or or you've kept that hidden from them? I think some of them already know. Uh, yeah. Because uh, on, on on Facebook, I do write sometimes about these things, and um, I personally received a few uh, disturbing comments also. But I cut those people off. I did. I don't yeah. really need those kind of people in my life. Yeah, so that toxicity in your life, yeah. That yeah, toxicity. I had, I, yeah. I had uh, my my ex is from a, a devout Catholic family, and I'm always posting stuff on my page. And she says, "Can you stop?" I went, "No, it's my page." <laughs> maybe, they'll, maybe they'll learn something if they're offended by it you know maybe yeah. they should be offended by what i'm writing maybe it'll make them think so okay. <laughs> yeah so so you're also a, a volunteer with with the atheist support network so can you maybe chat with are, are you mainly dealing with with other uh, people in bangladesh who are questioning or are you talking to muslims of, of all from all different cultures so there are atheists who need for example um support in trainings you know if they would like to take like a refugee visa that is different some of them come also through student visa so i'm trying to give support if somebody needs to improve their english skills or if somebody needs to just have somebody to talk with and sometimes uh, there are cases where i help them to find out where to go to be safe uh, so this kind of uh, help i'm trying to do from my side but you're, you're not focused just specifically on, on free thinkers from Bangladesh, but just from any, no. anybody who wants to talk. So From everywhere, yeah. <laughs> and it's, you find it rewarding? I do, I do. Actually, as soon as I came out as an atheist, uh, I, I right away, I think, I started looking for other, other atheists. And uh, I felt that it is now my, uh, you can say, responsibility to give something back, you know. Uh, I have learned. Uh, but that is what about learning, isn't it? Like we first learn about something, then we give back. Uh, it, it's true for science also. So I first learn science and someday I become a scientist and I give back to the society. Similar way, when I left the religion, I understood how toxic religion is and the kind of uh, damage it does to our societies and uh, overall human, human lives and standard of living. I, I decided, okay, this is this is the time to kind of give back and help others. It's very admirable of you. So, I mean, while while being respectful of the privacy of the people who come to Atheist Support Network, is is there one one person that really stands out in your mind that was it was very rewarding for you to to have helped this person? Yeah, there there is one one girl from Saudi, and. Um, I remember talking to her over phone for hours and she was devastated. She was devastated because um, her entire family is against her. She she was trying to run away from her family. And as an ex-Muslim woman, I feel the kind of helplessness, trauma she was going through. So when she reached a safe place, <laughs> finally, I remember all the way when she was catching a train, she was like catching a public transport to go there. All the way she was like texting me, keeping in touch with me. We were together looking at different options. And when she finally made to the safe safe place, I think I, I felt very emotional 
I felt like, wow, uh, I, I'm very glad she's she's safe and I hope she's doing well. Yeah. No. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. So hopefully our our viewers will, will be feel the gratitude of the, the hard work that uh, all of you volunteers put in and, and the help that we're giving and that, that you you guys give of yourselves selflessly you give of your time some of our volunteers even give their own money to help people um so okay anything else you, that you'd like to talk to us about your you know your what's next for you uh the next is of course i would like to go forward with my scientific career but at the same time i hope to leave a signature in this amazing movement that we see around the world now coming to forefront this ex-muslim movement i think it's very important for for the muslim communities around the world to start uh, learning about ex-muslims and start accepting us the way we are i think like um Instead of fear, instead of uh, this shaming and violence, we will achieve much more if we have peaceful coexistence. So uh, as, as, a, as a child growing up in Muslim family, uh, I felt loved, uh, although there were, of course, religion inflicted <laughs> discriminations, but I felt loved. And I wish even after we lost faith on Islam, our relatives, friends felt the same for us as they did before, because that is the least we can do as humans. I yeah. certainly do not have less love for them just because I'm an ex-Muslim. I do love them exactly the way I did before. And that is what I see over and over, these ex-Muslims who are running away to save their lives. You know, They do not love their family less, but it is really sad that uh, the Muslim communities are not yet open to accept that there are people among them who do not believe in Allah and do not find Islam convincing. And so I'm looking forward to a society where we can coexist and still celebrate maybe eat together just like a neutralized Christmas, you know, why not? It's just, just a celebration and we can still greet each other and uh, have good times with each other. And that is something I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, I think it's coming. The uh... I mean, there, there's ex-Muslims groups springing up all over the place. There was ex-Muslims in North America. There's in the UK. And we have Sarah Hyder, uh, Hyder Hader. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name and you're watching. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, these groups are out there. Uh, and I've, I've seen some articles, people saying that the the Islamic uh, Reformation is coming, that it's their their, their enlightenment is, is due. We're in the information age. People, people have access to information in books like you did, so that they're, they're their day is coming where it's going to be a big shift in, and, and I've met quite a few ex-Muslim atheists and I used to work in Pakistan back in 2018 and I met quite a few people uh, there who didn't believe. So it's, uh, the, oh, but obviously in certain cultures, they just, they can't be vocal about it. So, I mean, there, there's a large and growing uh, demographic of non-believers in Muslim countries, but they're just they're practically invisible for their own safety. So, but they're yeah. there. So, yeah. so if you're if you're living in a Muslim culture and you're watching this, please know you're not alone. There are ex-Muslim groups you can reach out to. There's people like Arena you can reach out to at ASN. I, I highly recommend. Please reach out to us if you need if you need some of that emotional support and just need someone to talk to. Uh, we're there for you. So please reach out. So. Okay, and I'm, well. I'm really positive about this entire uh, change that is coming. I absolutely agree to it. And in the last two years, I have seen with my own eyes about eight people losing faith on Islam. And uh, it happened right in front of me. Uh, and I have also seen Muslims who are being more open. It's not like uh, there are like two sides to it. Like in one hand, there are Muslims who are leaving faith altogether. There are Muslims who are becoming more tolerant. They're saying that, no, we cannot really uh, keep ignoring the fact that there are people like Irina, you know what I mean? So I have Muslim friends still now in my in my life who are absolutely amazing people. They know I'm an ex-Muslim. They don't care. I'm just a friend to them. So I hope that this, this entire dynamics keep progressing and eventually we reach that society where we can coexist. Yeah, and I, I've made the point myself as well that when when people point the finger, it's like the majority, like the majority of Christians, the majority of Muslims are moderates. They're not extremists. 
I've had, you know, some of my closest friends in my life have been Muslim. I've even dated a Muslim girl uh, within like within the last 10 years. So, you know, it's not everyone, not everybody is like, you know, is crazy or fundamentalist. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us, Erin. It was great chatting with you. And I look forward to hearing uh, about your, your next step in your life. It'd be, be exciting to follow your career. And hopefully one day, you know, you'll, you'll win the Nobel Prize and uh, I can say oh. that. Okay. Yeah, thank right. you. Thank you for inviting me. It was very nice to talk to you. Yeah, great. Okay, so remember everybody, please like and subscribe and we'll talk to you all the next week. So again, once again, Thanks everybody for joining. I, I hope you you learned something from Marina. And if you if you're a Muslim, uh, in, or in a Muslim society, and you're questioning and looking for free thought, please reach out. So, all right, take care everybody, and we'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye bye. Okay, thanks for listening and don't forget we're on YouTube, so follow us on YouTube, just search for Atheist Alliance International and please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We're also on all of your favourite podcast platforms, so make sure that you follow us on there as well. See you next time.